We only knew that there were transports going to the east. That was the expression that was used. But otherwise, we knew nothing. The Jews rightly or wrongly have the reputation of being shrewd and cunning, and they perhaps don't like to admit to it, but we are fooled completely. By 1942, trains were taking Jews to their death from all over Europe. Few people guessed where the journey would end. Let me tell you, I'd never heard the word of Auschwitz until I reached it. Then my father said, what can you see? And I said, it's getting quite light here. Then I was able to tell him more. I can see barbed wire, I can see watchtowers, I can see men with rifles, with machine guns, soldiers and SS men. Then I said to him, I can see people in striped clothes. Then he said, we are in a concentration camp. The train hadn't quite stopped, but the carriage doors were torn open and the command, get out, get out, was screamed at us. Leave your luggage in the carriage. We jumped out and there were orders, men to the right, women with children to the left, women without children further to the left. These pictures are from an SS guard's photo album. There was sun, and you know, if in the middle of the night you, 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 you light a lamp, you can't see for a minute. And that was the same feeling I had, because it was rather dark inside, and uh, I couldn't see, but then I thought, oh, nice, fresh air, no smell of death, no dogs. The ramp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. This was where the selection took place. I saw him standing there with his feet splayed, his hand up and his finger going from right to left, from right to left, and on one side I could see old people, ill people, women, and what was worst, women with children. There was a young woman who appeared to be about 20 years old, and there was a baby. She was holding a baby by the hand. And I went up to her and I bent down to her and whispered that she should give the baby to me and I would have got rid of it for her. But when I said to her that she should give me the baby, she started to cry. I wouldn't let go of the baby. So I went away immediately and hid. Small children were sent straight to their death with their mothers. He looked at the children and said, don't take the children's hands. I looked at him and said, why not? And he said, one day you'll understand. These pictures show Jewish families on their way to their death. On the tracks, I saw a little girl whom I didn't know. She was crying and looking for her shoes. I went straight up and took her hand, but this prisoner was just behind me. Through clenched teeth, he said to me angrily, didn't you understand what I said? Straight away, I thought, here is danger. I let the little girl's hand go, took her to the other children, and went over to the other side. This image pursues me till now. I can still see this little girl. Did I have the right to let go of her hand? Did I have the right to live? That's the question I've been asking myself all these years. Auschwitz was once a Polish barracks, but had become a concentration camp for prisoners from Poland and Germany. 
The commander here came from the concentration camp at Dachau, as did the cynical phrase, work makes you free. In Auschwitz, work made nobody free. The real system was destruction through work. That meant the prisoners were forced to work as long as they could, and if they couldn't anymore, they were shot or poisoned or later sent to a gas chamber. In spring 1941, Hitler was planning his offensive against the Soviet Union. His main aim was to conquer extra land. The annihilation of the Jews was actually his second aim. The most important was to get more territory, to be a world power. Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. Meanwhile, special units called Einsatzgruppen were carrying out the task of murdering the Jews. First Lieutenant Pietscher, a reserve officer, had traveled with SS officers in a train from Kharkov to Leipzig and they had been showing off about what we know today the Einsatz units did, and he asked me, can it be true? I must say at that time I didn't know any of the details. Can it be true, he asked me, and I answered, can you make such things up? At that time, the biggest problem in Auschwitz was the, the typhus epidemic. And not only the prisoners died, uh, several guards died of uh, Auschwitz, of, uh, of typhus. Uh, um, the, the civilian workers who were working in Auschwitz were protesting about it. They didn't want to work in Auschwitz anymore because so many of them were affected with uh, typhus. An insecticide, Zyklon B, was used in Auschwitz against the lice which carry typhus. This promotional film was made by the Nazis in 1938. Blausäure, die ja äußerst giftig ist, eignet sich zur Schädlingsbekämpfung ganz besonders. Hier ihre einfachste Anwendungsart. Man lässt sie von porösen Gipswürfeln aufsaugen, die dann in gewöhnlichen Blechbüchsen gasdicht verschlossen werden. Mit Blausäure durchgast man größte Betriebe ohne jede Gefahr für Mensch und Material. Gas! Gas! You had to get completely undressed and give up all your things, which were then thrown into a boiler where the lice were supposed to be killed. The things were either supposed to be washed or have the lice killed, I can't remember which anymore. The naked women had then to stand on chairs, on two chairs, and the men shaved them. They were shaved in all the personal areas. By 1941, on the Eastern Front, hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers were now prisoners of the Germans. Officers, communists and Jews were all to be shot, either at the front or in concentration camps. Some were taken to Auschwitz. Some of them were killed already on a railroad station. Some of them were brought to a kiss group. There was a in front of the of entrance to the camp, there was a kiss group and number eins, which is now non-existent, it's all filled out. And some of them were killed over there. If there were any officers or other officers or Jews or, or um, communists or polytruk, they continuously, the assessment continuously asked, who is the Jew, who is the polytruk? And they were killed right away before they entered the camp. This was Block 11, the death block. Here, Auschwitz guards carried out an experiment. What I noticed when I was cleaning, especially on the outside of the block, that all these openings to the basement were covered up with dirt, with soil. And I was wondering why they covered it all up. It was all covered up. So they, they, they made it like uh, airtight, the whole building. One night in September 1941, concentration camp guards drove 600 Soviet prisoners of war and 250 sick prisoners through this door. 
what later I found out from this Leichenträger, those were the people who were removing the bodies, they told me that many of those bodies were, had like a bluish foam on their mouths. Some of them had a bluish stuff coming from the noses and from ears. And they say that they were gassing there because they, the, 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 the first Leichenträger who went to the basement, they gave them gas masks as well, the prisoners who were dragging the bodies out. The experiment was deemed to be successful. These were the first murders using Zyklon B. It was the first time in human history when such a, when the killing of people was reduced to a, an industrial process. As if, and it was something that removed the humanity from, from us all. The Russians who were still alive were to become forced laborers. A huge camp had been erected close to Auschwitz for the prisoners of war. They called it Birkenau. There wasn't a single blade of grass there. There was only hard clay soil. There wasn't a single tree, let alone any flowers. There were no birds flying over Birkenau. While the first barracks were built in Birkenau, methods of killing by gas at Auschwitz were improved. The first gas chamber was built in the mortuary of the crematorium. It was a kind of a perverse um, work of high technology, German high technology. Hitler's campaign on the Eastern Front was not going well, so there were fewer prisoners of war available to work. In January 1942, Himmler ordered that these dwindling numbers should be replaced by Jews. Anyone who couldn't work was condemned to death immediately. Weshalb es Juden und Bakterien und Leisen früher und ungeziefer aller Art gibt, ich weiß es nicht. Juda wird und muss vernichtet werden. Das ist unser heiliger Glaube. If you had the power to reduce people to a level that would in normal circumstances be unthinkable, then you can say, they are not human and I am not going to treat them as human beings. The SS men who threw the poison gas cylinders into the gas chambers were officially called disinfection officers or pest control operatives. April 1942, Hitler's birthday. Soon afterwards, Auschwitz was to become a death factory for Jews from all over Europe. This is the end of the railway line at Auschwitz-Birkenau. From June 1942 onwards, hundreds of thousands of people were sent to their death from here. <laughs> People arriving by train were transported to the camps by lorry. Healthy people, together with sick people and dead people. They had to get undressed in little barracks. And then, naked, they were driven into the bunkers. On the doors of the bunker it said, to the washroom, as though they were going to be disinfected. These are the ruins of a farmhouse in Birkenau. It was converted by the SS into a gas chamber. Then a car drove up that had a red cross on it, and it brought the gas. Zyklon B. The SS man filled the room with gas through a little window and people suffocated as a result of the gas. 
SS Chief Himmler visited Auschwitz in July 1942. During the visit, he was taken to inspect the gas chamber. Himmler always used the same phrases when praising those involved. Von euch werden die meisten wissen, was es heißt, wenn 100 Leichen beisammen liegen. Wenn 500 da liegen oder wenn 1000 da liegen. Dies durchgehalten zu haben und dabei abgesehen von menschlichen Ausnahmeschwächen anständig geblieben zu sein, ist ein niemals genanntes und niemals zu nennendes Ruhmesblatt. Das waren Befehlsempfänger. The men who worked there comforted themselves with the idea that they were put in this terrible situation and had to do their duty for the people, the fatherland and national socialism. These were ordinary men with power over life and death. Well, that's what Auschwitz was like. You can only really grasp it when you think it right through to its final consequences. But that was the routine. That was the daily routine. In Auschwitz on the 18th of July 1942, SS Chief Himmler pronounced himself satisfied with the progress of the murders. Someone who knew what was happening passed on the information and news of the murder of Jews reached Geneva. What was going on there exceeded everything that you could imagine. I myself struggled for two days over whether it was all possible. Today we know that six million Jews were killed. But if you're told for the first time that an order has been given that three and a half or four million Jews are to be killed, is it at all possible? It's inconceivable. What world do we live in? In August 1942, Gerhard Riegner took action. He sent a telegram. At this point, Hitler seemed invincible. Remember, at the high point of the crimes, Hitler controlled continental Europe. He, his armies reached from the Atlantic to Moscow. At this time, Hitler was at his headquarters in the Ukraine, directing the last big offensive against Stalingrad. In Berlin, Eichmann was organizing the deportation of the Jews. Two weeks before we got the news of the final solution, the whole of Western Europe had started a massive persecution of Jews in all the big cities. In Amsterdam, in Antwerp, in Brussels, in Paris, in Marseille, in Lyon, tens of thousands of Jews were arrested on the same day the 14th to the 15th of July, 1942. Some of them had already been sent on to the East and nobody knew why it was happening. What had suddenly happened? Why were these mass arrests taking place? In the summer of 1942, 80,000 Jews were living in Amsterdam. Now they were all condemned to death. The so-called Jewish quarter was closed off and a car with a, a loudspeaker came through the streets announcing, attention, attention, this is the German police, you will be fetched from your homes, get ready, take a rucksack, some food and covers. Nothing will happen to you, you will work in Germany. Holland, 1942. 
This film was made secretly. Jews left their homes, never to return. On the same day, their furniture was confiscated. What's going to happen? How will this end up? What will they do with us? Will we be beaten? Will we be tortured? Will we be handed over to the SS or the security police? There are so many questions. Nobody knew what was happening or what was going to happen. This was Westerbork camp in Holland. Towards the end of the war, Jews from Holland were taken on trains to Auschwitz. It was a journey to death. Young Jews like Hans Margules had to help. We had to close the doors. They didn't touch anything. The camp commandant was with his SS people and the police who accompanied the train. He just walked up and down with an Alsatian dog. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. The cattle trucks were filled with people for the journey to the death camps. You normally would transport cows like that, I suppose, and sheep. They, they put human beings in. So you were standing up most of the time and there were no sanitation. Uh, no, not meaningful sanitation, perhaps a bucket in a corner or something like that. That was the time when really the whole weight of all the facts came tumbling down. You were no longer considered a human being. This was the ramp where people arrived at Birkenau. Whoever survived the selection was to be worked to death in the camp. You had to get up at five o'clock in the morning. There was a cup of coffee and a little piece of bread, a hundred grams, and that was our breakfast. Then there were physical jerks. The whole camp had to run around, lie down, stand up, lie down, stand up. And if you couldn't manage any more, an SS man would hit you on your back. And that's what it was like at the beginning for two weeks. It was cruel. We called to God, please help us, dear God, but God didn't help. The most important thing at Auschwitz was bread, having a little bit to eat, and shoes. And they were stolen every night. Every night you heard shouting in the block, my shoes have been stolen, one would call, and another would call, they've stolen my bread. And if we discovered somebody who had done that, we would kill him. If somebody stole once, he would do it again. Victim was set against victim. That was all part of the strategy. One day a, a man clambered onto my mattress from behind and I knew exactly what he wanted. I wanted to scream, but suddenly his hand, full of bread, came up to my mouth. And I ate the bread because I was hungry. And then he did what he wanted to.
When he'd gone, I'd noticed that he'd stolen my cap. At this time in Auschwitz, and in the other camps at Auschwitz, a prisoner at morning roll call without a cap was a dead prisoner. I'm sure this man didn't want there to be any witnesses for what he'd done. He knew that I would be shot at morning roll call. But I wanted to survive, so I pinched a cap from another prisoner. I'd never seen him before. I didn't know what his name was, whether he was young, whether he was old, whether he was a Jew, a Pole, a Frenchman, a German, or a Spaniard. I have no idea. The next morning, this prisoner was shot. I survived. The most terrible thing was that the Nazis made me as a victim do things which, as a normal human being, I would never have done. One lovely day I went into labour and Mengele came to see me and he gave an order that my breasts must be bandaged so I wasn't able to feed my child. My breasts were bandaged with some rags and the child started to cry because he had nothing to eat. And then a doctor who worked there a Jewish woman doctor came and said to me, I've brought you an injection, give it to your child. And I asked her, what sort of injection is it? And she said, it's just morphine. I thought I couldn't hear properly. I said to her, do you want me to kill my own child? But she talked and talked and talked until I just had no resistance left. I killed my own child. November 1942. In a beer hall in Munich, Hitler made a speech. Sie haben mich immer als Prophet ausgelacht. Von denen, die damals lachten, lachen heute unzählige nicht mehr. Die jetzt noch lachen, werden in einiger Zeit vielleicht auch nicht mehr lachen. But what did the German people really know about Auschwitz? Everyone in Germany knew that there were concentration camps and that people were taken there without any proper trials. This breach of legality should have been reason enough to cause outrage. But nobody in Germany knew what was actually going on in the concentration camps, because even those who were released were not allowed to talk about it. So in their own interest they did not talk about it, because otherwise they would have been arrested again immediately. In Dresden, on the 23rd of November 1942, Jews were told to clear their flats. People must have seen that the flats were suddenly empty. It can't have remained a secret. That people did nothing about it, that's another matter. We don't want to discuss that. But I cannot imagine that people didn't see what was going on. Later, many of the Jews from Dresden would be deported to Auschwitz. The moment passed. It passed like a flash when you say to yourself, something terrible's happening there. 
but what and how and where, you didn't know. You really didn't know. By Christmas 1942, five months had passed since Gerhard Riegner sent his telegram to the Allies. I sat here and looked at Mont Blanc and the Blue Lake and waited for some news. German soldiers were already five kilometers away from here at the Jewish cemetery in Verbier that was the border. Hell began five kilometers away from here. And I was sitting in these lovely surroundings, looking at the lovely lake and the lovely mountains, and couldn't do anything. You almost went mad. On December the 17th, 1942, the Allies signed a declaration condemning the Nazis. When it was read out in the House of Commons, MPs stood for several minutes of silence. Politicians like Lloyd George wrote in their memoirs, there's never been anything like this before. You thought that something would happen, but nothing happened. At Christmas in the Vatican, Pope Pius XII alluded to the mass murder in his message to the world. Saving the Jews was not at the top of the Allied agenda or the Pope's agenda, as murdering the Jews was at the top of Hitler's agenda. In the mountains, Hitler celebrated Christmas with his henchmen's children. The radio was playing a Christmas concert for his soldiers. The Christmas tree in Auschwitz was lit and the guards sang Silent Night. The next day, an SS man went through the men's camp. He'd wanted to go home for Christmas, but hadn't been given any holiday, and so he took it out on the Jews. He shouted, Happy Christmas, and shot one after the other. On the 9th of January 1943 in East Prussia, Marshal Antonescu, the Romanian leader, paid a state visit to Hitler's headquarters. Antonescu was Hitler's ally in the war against Stalin and the Jews. Hitler did not openly discuss the mass murder that was taking place. What I'm going to say now, many may not believe. Although I was in the thick of things, I didn't hear anything about Auschwitz until after the war. In fact, Hitler was con listening in and teaching their juniors to do the same. You must listen in, my son. You must listen in carefully. And then you will know what a pack of criminals you are living amongst. And then he showed me, during the night shift, how you could do it without being noticed, with a sharpened match. And it worked. One call came through for Bormann from SS Chief Himmler. It was about the number of people to be killed every week at Auschwitz. Himmler called Bormann, who acted as Hitler's secretary, on the telephone and said, I've got good news for the Führer. In Auschwitz, 20,000 Jews have been liquidated. 
But Bowman interrupted him angrily and reminded him of his obligation to think of what the Führer had commanded. And that was that news relating to this subject should only be sent by courier direct to Bormann personally, and he would then pass it on. Despite stringent security, people living in the surrounding area soon began to realize what was happening in the death factory. Although we only lived, as I've already said, about 30 kilometers from Auschwitz, we didn't know that the camp was an extermination camp, killing people with gas. But at the end of 1942, the first news started to filter through. We got the first news about Auschwitz from my brother, Hans Deichmann. At a very early stage, somebody had said to him, you can see what's going on there. You can see the chimney. You can see the smoke. That's people. You could hardly live if you knew everything. You couldn't sleep if you'd thought about such things. I said to myself, I mustn't think about it, otherwise I just won't be able to carry on. Think about it. I put my head in the sand. Elsewhere in Germany, people for the most part got on with their lives. After the defeat at Stalingrad, Germans were preoccupied with their own survival. My sister wrote to us in a letter from prison that for the first time she'd met somebody who'd come back out of Auschwitz and everything that had been said about Auschwitz was true. I think if I look back that young as I was, I had prepared myself for the idea that that was the way it was going to end. In Auschwitz-Birkenau, the insignificant building at the end of the ramp was hardly noticed. In fact, it was the first of four crematoria with gas chambers built for mass murder. He asked, is your mother with you? I said, no, no, she's on the left. Instead of answering, he led me to the door, opened it and there were flames reaching right up to the sky out of a chimney. And he said without any emotion, that's where she went, up the chimney. I thought now, why is he talking nonsense like that? I thought, poor chap, he's completely lost his marbles. Only a few personal possessions were left behind. Suitcases from everywhere in Europe bore the names of those who had been killed. And of some who survived, like Zdenka Fantlova. Gas chambers didn't mean anything to me. What were gas chambers? What did they mean? You know, our mind isn't constructed in a way that would mean we could make sense of it. And how could people on the outside believe it, who weren't there when we were standing in front of the gas chamber and we didn't believe it? It was mad, and so it wasn't true. Many spent months in Auschwitz-Birkenau before they understood what was happening. I heard loud screaming and went out of the block, although during the night you obviously weren't allowed to go out. There were the tracks leading through the door of death into the crematorium, and I saw the trains and I heard the screaming of women who were being driven inside. And then the flames came up out of the fireplace, and for the first time it was quite clear to me that they weren't sick people, 
They weren't corpses who were being burnt, but they were living people who'd been brought in and were being killed and burnt. That was the first I knew of the mass deaths of people who weren't brought into the camp but were simply taken direct from the train into the crematorium. In August 1943, it was the first time that it had really sunk into my consciousness. In the crematoria, Jewish prisoners had to do the worst work of all. They were called the Sonder Commando, the death squad. We saw another transport coming, living human beings. Lovely human beings, and we knew what was going to happen to them. The little wood in front of crematorium 4 was the last stop before the gas chamber. These people were waiting for death. The Germans were telling them, you're going to get some hot showers, make the shoes tied susame, I remember that, to tie the shoes together, so when they're coming out, they got to find the shoes together again for the people. So the people were not suspicious that they were going in the gas chamber. They were deceived until the moment of death. These photographs show Jewish women just before they went into the gas chamber. The people who were in there were still laughing and they were still asking where they were. But we could only be quiet and not say anything about what was going to happen to them. If we had told them, they would have suffered even more. They would have started to scream and cry. Only a very small number of people managed to get out of here alive. I said to myself, um, Samuel Pizar, you are now uh, in the face of uh, the ultimate and absolute moment. And I saw in the corner of the barrack a bucket of water and a big brush. So I crawled over there and I took the bucket and the brush. Maybe it was a nervous reaction and nothing else in the face of death. And I started to scrub the floor, wash the floor, until I came to the exit of the barrack where two SS guards were staying with their carabines on their shoulders. Seeing me there scraping, they must have assumed that I was there to do a job. And then I came there with three steps. I stood up, I picked up the bucket, I put the brush on my shoulder and I slowly walked out, waiting any moment for them to yell, Halt! Where do you think you're going? Nothing. And in a few minutes, I was in the camp among the other prisoners. These are the ruins of the gas chamber at Crematorium 2 in Auschwitz. They close the door and 3,000 people at a time. I was getting away from there. I couldn't stand at the voices. They were calling in, in Hebrew. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The scream was our most holy prayer. Israel. And the SS man turned it into a German phrase, Schmas Rhein, Schmas Rhein, which means chuck them in. This gas chamber at Maidenek concentration camp was preserved. And 20 minutes later, about 30 minutes later, when they open up, 
what did I see? I saw the same people that I saw 20 or 30 minutes ago, all black and blue, dead, standing up with the children. With her. And he says, my God, I says, how can I survive in such an environment? When the gas chambers were opened up, the people were standing up. They died standing up. They stood like that next to each other. Some had linked arms and they died like that. Excrement and urine were everywhere. Anything that they had on them was on the floor, all in a muddle on the floor. It was a tragedy. These ovens were found in Buchenwald concentration camp. They are identical to the ones in Auschwitz. After the burning, we had to sieve out all the bits of bone that was still left over and make them smaller. There were three different sieves, large, small, and still smaller, and they were sieved and sieved until the ashes were as fine as dust. When there was enough dust, a truck came along and they were taken to the Vistula, to the river Vistula, and the dust was shaken into the river. One survivor describes how he was shown the crematorium. Und siehst du an der Seite, sagt er, von die Wande sind alles Kratzen von die Nagel. And look at the site, he said. Look at the site. Look at the walls. People have been scratching with their nails, struggling in their final death throes. And then he showed me some tongs. We put them round their necks and then we pulled them out. And I said, and then they're burned? No, he said. Then they go in that room over there, and if they've got gold teeth, they're taken out. And then, he said, then they go into the ovens. More than a million Jews were murdered here. No one was ever expected to survive the gas. When they opened the doors of the gas chamber, we heard some crying. What it was, I think, was a baby on top of the dead bodies, crying. He didn't get killed from the gas. So we call uh, the German, we said that somebody is crying and so on. So on. And he didn't get them too much, uh, the German. He went in it with his uh, gun. He shot him and that's how he killed him. It was kind of a miracle, but the German killed him. And there's more compelling drama here on More 4 from 10 past 9 tonight as Jim Broadbent stars as Lord Longford in a story exploring his relationship with Myra Hindley. Next here, this week's Snowmail.